Hey there, welcome back to uh, Yolitics. We are on location right now um, at a place called White Rock Brewing Company. This is just west of the skyline. Wheeler's mouth is full. He's trying to research his beer. He's just ordering blindly I off am. the menu here. So White Rock Brewing Company, this place opened in April. It's brand new here, huge place. Yeah. They started brewing their beer when they opened, I presume, or recently. No, yeah. they're not brewing it yet. They're in there working on it. They're, they're going to start ready. brewing in late July so that they're ready to start serving their own in August. You are paying attention, Wheeler. It's impressive. I'm always paying attention. It just doesn't look like <laughs> it or sound like it a lot of times. So our, our guest today, let, let, let's dive in and we'll talk about what we're all drinking here. Okay. You want to take control of so this? So what, well, what they're doing right now is they're serving other people's beers on tap right. until they get theirs rolling again uh, sometime in August. Uh, and I decided on this St. Michael... St. Michael Brewery. I don't know where that's from. I can't find it. Uh, <laughs> it's the Blackberry Mead. Which is like a 13th century uh, I guess so. monastery that, that brewed this. The, and this is a very fruity beer. It's almost like well, you juice. Like fruit. It, it almost tastes like juice, uh, which makes it very dangerous because then you <laughs> think, well, I can drink some more of that because it tasted good. And I think it's 8% alcohol by volume. And, and for the people who are watching this, actually, on, on our YouTube, you, you'll see that, that Wheeler has two glasses of this. Well, uh, I didn't control that. No. Up. She brought two. Uh, I ordered one. They're short, so I don't know if that makes one. I don't know how that works. I don't know how they, they did it back in Europe in those days. Um, and by the way, if you don't watch this on YouTube, but you're more visually inclined, we do have the podcast on YouTube now. Uh, it's uh, Just search for Yolitics there on YouTube. It's right there. What are I'm, you drinking, I'm Scott? Having... Well, let's oh, to our, sorry. Let's no, to our you, guest is here. I, I forgot to ask you, what are you drinking? Uh, this whole thing's off the rails before we even get <laughs> it going is, here. It, it, right. As usual. I, I'm having the uh, the Super Dry from Westlake. This is a Japanese rice lager oh, nice. from, from Westlake. It's like a Sapporo or a Kirin or something like that. Cheers. Big fan of this. So the guy we have here today is one of the hardest men to book he in is. Texas politics. <laughs> we, we've asked him several times. He's on the road. He's constantly moving. He's just happened to be up here uh, in North Texas where we're recording this. And said he could join us. And, Scott, we, and we lured him in by saying, hey, listen, you don't even have to order a beer off the menu. You can right. get a spirit. You can instead. have uh, whatever you want. Scott Braddock is the uh, the editor of the Quorum Report. He is, uh, I, I've known Scott for 23 years now. At least, yeah. And in fact, uh, your what? wife Kelly and I worked together at KTRH mm -hmm. in Houston when we were doing our time in the press corps in wow. that great city. A, a long time ago. Yeah, and, I didn't know that you guys went back that far. Yeah, oh, yeah. Go back a long so ways. I was born as you guys were meeting. <laughs> That's probably yeah. it. Yeah. You, you, you wish you were born while we were meeting. <laughs> okay. Wheeler, you know, again, Wheeler is uh, once again the oldest guy at the table here, but but loves to claim that, he, that he's a very youthful appearance. I can tell y'all in, in person, very, I would have bought that. Scott, I'm sorry. The music is loud in here. Could you repeat what you just said? <laughs> yeah, 23 years old. So Scott Braddock, if you don't follow him on Twitter, you should after you follow me and Wheeler. Uh, but but Scott constantly breaks stories down there. He's one of the best source reporters uh, in Austin. So that's why we want to have him on to pick his brain about what's well, been going on it. down there. So, thanks for having me. So thanks for being here. What are you Absolutely. drinking, man? Uh, well, I have been through a regular <laughs> session that was a nightmare, and now we're in the second special session so this is just vodka on ice. <laughs> and and I, I, I really like the uh, format of y'all's show where you had, you know get some beers and talk politics. But our show, The Texas Take, it's more of a hard liquor show. <laughs> and, and, hey, we and, don't and judge. For a long time, and I'm breaking a quorum report rule to do this. There are exceptions to all rules. Uh, anytime there's alcohol present, it is going to be off the record. That's the understanding from the beginning interesting. at QR. However, I, in recent years, I had to sort of amend that to say that, hey, with the times that we're all having COVID and the COVID session two years ago and the quorum break and what we're having now, there's always some alcohol present in my system. So everything starts <laughs> off the record and then we go from there. This is Scott. a perfect podcast for you then. Yep. But, but before we get going, though, uh, not only are you the editor of the quorum report, yes, you're, you're a machine on Twitter. Mm -hmm. You're keeping everyone updated on what's happening behind the scenes. Yeah. But you're also the co-host of the Texas Take. Another political podcast, a little different from ours, mm -hmm. uh, but, but tell us about that one, too, and where people can find it. So in the last month, we passed the seven-year mark of doing the Texas Take. Uh, new I podcast, was, the new one. I, right? Yeah, I, was, <laughs> this, I had never even heard a podcast when they asked me if I would huh. be interested in doing it. It was not my idea. A friend of mine uh, who was working at the Houston Chronicle, he doesn't work there anymore, <laughs> he called me one day and said, Scott, what do you know about doing a podcast? And I, you know, I, I had done radio professionally for 20 years, um, and so I thought it can't be that different. Uh, and I really thought this was going to be a volunteer thing. I'm going to go in and show them how to do it, and then I'd be done with it. It always starts that way, Scott. Seven years later, I'm the only original surviving cast member. Are you really? I've had you know many co-hosts, uh, and the, the one I have now, Jeremy Wallace, is also a 
machine. You see him breaking stories all the time. He travels Texas uh, and we do our best to try to kind of, it's different because y'all do the kind of show where you sit down with a guest and try to hash things out. We don't do that. We do something where we're trying to just make it all make sense for the listener every week. So many that you know. We don't do that never, at all, though. We, we never make sense we, on this podcast. Well, what we're doing that's different is we're trying to make all of it make sense, right. which is why I need the hard liquor. <laughs> <laughs> to keep, and and which is why you're still trying years later, because it doesn't all make it sense. It doesn't, right. And uh, and trying to synthesize it all and, and boil it down so it will make some sense to folks. And, you know, it's a power listen. Uh, you know, I hear from lawmakers, from staffers, uh, and from uh, candidates for office that they all listen. Uh, you know, lobbyists and folks like that, it's the first thing that they go look for on there. Cool. And, and I'm sure y'all are is the second thing they look for uh, but but you know it's it's sort of um different from what we do at quorum report as well which is if pe- people are not familiar with quorum report we are sort of you described it as the bible for texas politics i did have a republican um office holder once tell me that every morning he would read the quorum report and the bible so that he got both sides of the story he was not always happy with our coverage um, but at quorum report our audience really is political professionals um and so th- that is lawmakers staffers lobbyists etc people who are really in the mix. And so we're breaking news for a very sophisticated audience. Yeah, you are the insider's insider, yeah. and it is phenomenal, the stuff that you get. And and I was really interested just a moment ago in you saying that you have this longstanding rule where if there's alcohol involved, it's all off the record. How many things have you heard over the years <laughs> off the record that have blown your socks off? Well, I, my publisher, Harvey Kronberg, established the rule years ago because he, when he would say, hey, this is off the record, there were a lot of people who wouldn't believe him. So it was a way to put them at ease. Oh, hey, if there's a drink, you know, we're good to go. And people would laugh and say, OK, yeah, fine. But we do take it seriously. I would put I would answer your question this way. If we reported 70 percent of what we know, probably no one would tell us anything. If we reported 80 percent of what we know, there might be a hit out on us. Wow. There's, you know, there's a lot of insider info that's coming across the transom every day, and so we try to figure out what's relevant to report in real time. Wow, that's well, stunning. So, anything been going on in Austin lately? <laughs> <laughs> it has you been seemed, busy. Well, um, the insiders will get this joke, uh, and maybe nobody else will. But as the second special session was starting yesterday, I was walking through the Capitol and telling people, if we can just keep the momentum from the last special going, <laughs> this next one is going to be so productive, so amazing, it's going to be incredible, as former President Trump might say. It's going to be terrific. You've never <laughs> seen such a great special session. It's the very best. Yeah, if you, if it's you the guys, very best one ever. If you guys haven't been keeping up and don't know the inside jokes, uh, the first special session wasn't really that special, uh, in all honesty. It looked a lot like the end of the regular session. Uh, it, it was specifically to call these lawmakers back and go, hey, get property tax reform done yep. here in Texas. Mm-hmm. It's the one thing that you can get pretty much everybody in the state, it seems, to agree on at some level uh, that it needs to be done. But it's not happening. And this isn't Democrats versus Republicans, mm-hmm. Scott. This is Republicans versus Republicans, and it's gridlock. Republican on Republican violence at the Capitol. It's my favorite thing to cover. Usually when you're talking about legislative business, it's not Democrats versus Republicans. It's usually the House versus the Senate. Yep. Uh, and that has been exacerbated in recent years. Lieutenant Governor Patrick, who, of course, presides over the Senate, and Speaker Dade Phelan, uh, who is now uh, you know, in his uh, sophomore session uh, as, as uh, Speaker, um, they clashed from the get-go uh, two years ago when, when Phelan first came into office. Um, that was during the COVID session when there were a lot of restrictions at the Capitol and everywhere else. Um, and there was a lot of tension around that. Then you had the quorum break where the Democrats fled to Washington to try to block the elections bill. You, rem- you might remember it was during an event that unfolds here in Dallas-Fort Worth, Texas OU weekend. Um, former President Trump, at the behest of Patrick, it's my belief that Patrick put him up to this, uh, th- that the former president called Speaker Phelan a rhino and that he was the Mitch McConnell of Texas uh, because he didn't want to go back and reopen that elections bill and debate it again uh, after it had already taken them eight months to pass that thing because they wanted to go back and uh, re, uh, re-up the, uh, the penalties for illegal voting uh, back up to a felony rather than a misdemeanor, which had been changed in that bill. Uh, so yeah, they, these guys, and, and at that time, it looked like Phelan was going to get a primary challenge based on that. Uh, former President Trump had said that he should get one. Uh, but nobody ran against Phelan. There was also a point during that session where Phelan was kicked out of the Senate chamber because he was not wearing. I forgot about that. You know, he was not yeah. wearing one of those COVID wristbands to show that he had gotten a test. This is all you know, yeah. pre-vaccine. Um, and uh, of course, Lieutenant Governor Patrick, who's the same guy who went <laughs> on Fox News Channel yes. and said that the elderly should at least be given the chance to sacrifice their lives for the economy. He was one of the ones who was the most strict 
about people getting their COVID test, about you know getting the vaccine and all that sort of stuff because he took it very seriously. He's an elder, and I get it, he's an elderly guy and he could have some complications, uh, but it was certainly hypocritical. All that to say, they have some history. They have not been getting along. They didn't get along uh, about property taxes at the beginning of the legislative session. They both had very different takes on what to do with all that extra money. You know, you remember at the beginning of the session, Governor Abbott was giving speeches where he would talk about how much extra cash there was going to be in the bank, right. an additional $33 billion surplus. Um, and he would say it as if it was an applause line and people would <laughs> clap when he would say we have all this extra money. And at the time, I thought, why are they clapping? If the government has that much more money in their bank account, yeah. instead of that money being in your bank account, that either means that they're overtaxing you or underserving you or both. And yeah. I think people could make that argument. Um, That's and a look, great point. And look, um, the elections have consequences. Think about what the uh, what the promises were from Greg Abbott uh, when he was beating Beto O'Rourke. And Beto, you know, God bless him, uh, he has tried to make a good first impression three times now. <laughs> when he ran for Senate, when he ran for president, and then ran for governor, right. it just didn't work out. But when Abbott was beating Beto, what what was the campaign from Abbott? Y'all covered it for eight or nine months. It was Washington sucks, Texas rocks, we're going to secure the border and cut your property taxes. That's about it. Wasn't much else. Um, And that means they have to deliver on this. I would say 17 billion extra dollars. You could do anything with that. You could spend it on roads. You could spend it on schools, port infrastructure, et cetera. We have uh, more than a thousand people moving to Texas every day. And when they come, they don't bring any of that stuff with exactly. them. They don't bring right. schools or water or any of that with them. Uh, and so there need to be investments. They are making some of those investments. But the campaign promises matter. It's the cliche, right? Campaigns have consequences. They have to deliver on property taxes. I think they'll get there uh, probably sometime in the middle of July. That's my guess. Don't hold me to that. I don't make predictions. Well, let's, yeah. uh, but, they've been, but they have been so far, to your point about this stalemate that they're in over property taxes, uh, I described it at quorumreport.com this week as a legislative Vietnam. They're, they've made this promise to win on this, but there's no path to get it, to getting out of it. A legislative Vietnam. That's new, oh, man. I, 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 I like that. It's pretty but, gnarly. But let's bring our, our uh, viewers and listeners up, up to speed on this. So the Senate has already passed its plan. The same thing as before, except Senator Roland Gutierrez, Democrat from San Antonio, has been out front on Uvalde since that happened last mm-hmm. May of, of 2022. Mm-hmm. He got included on the Senate plan uh, a, a bonus. Yep. For teachers, mm-hmm. one time bonus, two thousand dollars for teachers in urban areas, six thousand for teachers in rural areas. The Senate plan also includes a hundred thousand dollar homestead exemption, mm-hmm. which we, which we've seen in the regular sessions in the uh, first special, uh, the compression, which the House wants mm-hmm. uh, and that the governor wants that, that the governor wants mm-hmm. and the uh, elimination of the franchise tax for what, 60 something thousand small businesses yeah. across the state mm-hmm. which which is pretty remarkable mm-hmm. so the we're here we are on a holiday weekend the house is about to pass its plan and then the house reconvenes on wednesday the 5th what's going to happen is, is the house going to consider and entertain the senate plan this time or are we just going to be stuck in this vietnam for a decade uh, uh, on um uh, well it's the right question uh, on the surface it seems like they're not on track to see eye to eye again um, I, I have to believe that at this point, there have to be some kind of back channel negotiations going on between the lieutenant governor and the speaker. Have they not been talking um, they, all they, this time? They have not been talking. Um, the lieutenant governor has been on record saying uh, that the speaker is, quote, out of pocket, that he hasn't been able to reach him. Uh, I don't know if, you know, if we could scroll through the speaker's phone right now and, and see, you know, how many uh, missed calls from Dan Patrick that there are. I don't know how many there would be. I, I would guess it's not actually that many, maybe not any. Yeah. Um, but, but look, uh, Patrick's been litigating this in the media. Uh, he's been on the Mark Davis show here in Dallas, Fort Worth. He was bad mouthing the governor and the speaker uh, just this past week, uh, saying that the governor's veto threats, and we can talk about that if you like, the veto threats were a big nothing burger, and his actual vetoes were a big nothing burger. Uh, he said that the speaker just kind of through the impeachment of Kim Paxton at the Senate, and now they have to deal with it. Very dismissive of everything that's going on there. So uh, these guys are nowhere close um, to, at least publicly, they're nowhere close to getting down to really negotiating on these things that are very important to Texans. Uh, And look, whatever you think of their various plans, they got to do something. Lieutenant Governor Patrick is not going to back off of the homestead exemption at all. You might remember earlier in the session, it was his proposal to increase the homestead exemption to $70,000. Yeah. Then it became like an auction at the Capitol. The House said, well, well let's do, you know, House leadership said, let's do 100000 Well, Patrick embraced that, and now he's not backing off of it. Paul Bettencourt, who is a senator from Houston, uh, and the tax man in the Senate, the, the point man on the issue for the lieutenant governor, 
has said publicly that now that we've talked about a hundred thousand dollar exemption, people aren't going to accept anything less. Right. Yes. Although, although I think that that's bogus, and, and here's why. I'm not going to accept anything less. Guys. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, here, here's why. Do you, do you remember that a tax swap was debated in 2019 to increase sales taxes to buy down property taxes? I do remember, remember that. that. I do remember that. Almost yes. no one does. Just like do six months that. from now, almost no one would remember that they had talked about 170 and 60. Yeah. All they would know is that their exemption went from 40 up to 70. I think they can get there by moving those numbers around, but there hasn't been any public willingness, at least so far, to even try to do that. What, what, is this ego? Is it a power play? What, or do they just I, not I, like each other? Well, no, I, I mean, I can understand. They don't. Well, but look, here, like here's it. what I don't understand. So it is a lot of egos. Is this is this date feeling, you know, first day in prison, beating somebody up on day one so he doesn't get messed with the rest of the time? Or, or is, I mean, these guys aren't that far apart on, on ideology, I don't think. What, what, do, you, what do you think the, the, the gulf is between them? I, I, think, can feel it. I think in some ways they are far apart on ideology and on, on property taxes in particular. I mean, the original proposal from the speaker was to cap appraisals, which uh, Patrick says is completely the wrong way to go. Now, that is a long country mile from where Patrick was previously. When he ran for the Senate back in 2006, or when he was a state senator from Houston, and he won that race, and I think it was a, a Republican primary. If I remember right, there were six other candidates in the primary. He beat, I think you were there at the time. He um, beat all of them with no runoff made his way to the Texas Senate, largely based on the argument that we should cap appraisals. Mm. And I think he wanted to cap them at 3%. Mm. Now the speak, And now he says, we don't want to do that. Now he says, let's do the homestead exemption, which until a few years ago was a Democratic proposal. Mm. If you think about the homestead exemption, it's more of a progressive idea because you're doing more for middle-class homeowners, right? And so if you take $70,000 of every home in Texas off the tax rolls, or you take $100,000 off the tax rolls, uh, you know, you are, you are helping a lot of just average folks with that of course at some point that number can get too high that you couldn't say it was uh, any anything that was progressive anymore but patrick is the one making the sort of quote unquote uh, populist argument about this that that helps more individual homeowners rather than big business he says he doesn't want to help big business as much as the governor and the speaker but his plan would still help business by doing a certain amount of uh, property tax compression which no one knows what that means so let me help everybody <laughs> well, they don't right and, and here, right. Uh, here's the proof i did a focus group for y'all on this <laughs> the uh the aransas county republican club i was uh, speaking to that group uh just this past week uh down in uh, rockport fulton and it's a room of about 80 republicans and i said just raise your hand if you know what tax compression means if you've ever even heard that term only one hand went up, and it was the tax assessor collector for the county. Wow. Right? So, so point being, they're all smart, nice people, but people haven't heard of this. They don't know what it means. It just means the state picking up a bigger portion of the cost of public education by flowing more money through the school finance system. In the entire world, and I sat through the trial on school finance, the last one, on the whole planet, I think there are five people who fully understand the Texas school finance system. I'm not one of them, but I do know that flowing more money down to school districts will help to decrease uh, the need for local school districts to increase taxes. Think about how much it costs to uh, educate kids in this state. We have around 5.6, 5.7 million students in, in Texas. The Texas budget every two years is about a quarter trillion dollars. And a full half of that goes to public education, right. but it's not even the full cost of educating those kids, right? The taxes still have to be uh, it's not collected even full locally. 50% of it, I don't right. think, is that, it? That's right. And so it's not even, it's not close. I think it's it's still under 40%, yeah. I think, right now, uh, based on the latest numbers. So if you consider all of that, at some point, and, and I hope they can get into this discussion, the uh, the speaker established a special committee to talk about property taxes, to, to examine the issue, as if we don't all know that there are serious problems with the system. Uh, but maybe there will be some official recognition from that committee, maybe from the Texas House as a whole, that all of the proposals that are being talked about are not sustainable. If they put $17 billion into, into the cost yes. of public ed now to try to buy down local property taxes, that's only for two years, right? right? Two years from now, four years from now, six years right. from now, what's going to happen? And it was Lieutenant Governor Patrick, who, again, is not a liberal, was saying that to make up the difference, the money's got to come from somewhere. So you would have to see sales taxes increase as, as much as up to 20 percent, which you talk about regressive, but also just terrible for the economy. That's a that's a economic stimulus for the uh, for the economies of Oklahoma, Louisiana and New Mexico, yep. where people would be going to buy sta stuff in those other states rather than do it here. Um, so, look, there's not going to be an income tax in, t tax in Texas. Right. The old joke is that um, and uh, uh, 
God rest his soul, Wayne Slater at the Dallas Morning News used to always tell the joke, we'll have an income tax in Texas on the day that they agree to put uh, casinos in Baptist churches. <laughs> that's not going that's to happen. That's not going to happen. Right. So you've got uh, that completely off the table. But unless there's a complete remaking of the system, this is not going to get better for homeowners in the long run. All of these plans are really, I would say, nakedly political in nature because the governor and the lieutenant governor want to be able to make good, at least for right now, on their number one campaign promise to everybody in the state, which was some kind of property tax relief. Yeah, because you're, but, but the point is being made that you're not always going to have $33 billion surplus right. year after year, and, and, and you're going to have to figure out how to pay for this down the road as well. My question is this, and we're going to get into the impeachment stuff here yep. in just a minute of Ken Paxton. Oh, please. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, considering that impeachment uh, playing out mm -hmm. in September, considering what's, you know, playing out with this property tax fight where heavyweight Republicans are just slugging it out yeah, through yeah. the summer over this, and we still haven't even gotten into, you know, are, are they going to bring up school vouchers again, which Republicans mm -hmm. are infighting on that too. Yeah. Does this damage Republicans uh, as, you know, we get ready to go into another election year next year? I mean, uh, or, or are Democrats going to be able to get it together uh, in this state and, and, and make some inroads while there is that infighting? Uh, to the second question, probably not. Yeah. I'm not going to armchair quarterback Democratic campaigns, except just a little, just, <laughs> just, just, this, just this advice. Um, and this could have been uh, what Beto O'Rourke could have opened with at, at every rally and should have been in his television ads. Republicans are taxing you too much. That's why there's all that extra money in the government's bank account and not in yours. Uh, one of the reasons that there is so much extra money is because of inflation, right? While yep. Republicans have been railing against Joe Biden for inflation, uh, when the cost of everything was going up, sales taxes did not go down. That's right. Um, and so going forward, yeah, I, I don't know that it damages Republicans. I keep waiting for it to. You know, I have the same question every two years. Is the, is the latest property tax scheme or scam, is it going to catch up to these guys? You remember that in 2019, Governor Abbott gave speeches where he said, we are going to fix property taxes in Texas, period. Yeah, well, here we are in 2023, and this is the issue that they're wrestling with. Mm -hmm. As I was saying at the beginning of the legislative session, when a married couple fights about money, it's never because there's too much of it. But, <laughs> but with the state leadership, that's exactly what they're doing, fighting over how to spend this money and how to give it back to people who did pay too much in taxes, who should be furious. And look, it, it is a real bait and switch in Texas. And you might have seen where... Uh, uh, the California governor, uh, Gavin Newsom, was talking to uh, Sean Hannity the oh, other great. day, and they were talking. Yeah, it was good. It was a good conversation, uh, and they were talking about the tax situations in different states, um, and they were comparing California to Texas and California to Florida, and you know Ron DeSantis running around, you know, taking shots at at Gavin Newsom, but Newsom and Hannity from complete different, uh, you know, the opposite ends of the political spectrum, both of them agreed Texas is a higher tax state. In Florida, right? I'm sure Greg Abbott's office appreciated seeing that on Fox News Channel. Um, so look, I think that until they address it, you do have this bait and switch where people are told that Texas is a low tax state, move here, everything be just fine. They buy a home. And then where, the bill comes. If they buy a home that has any proximity to a job, yep. they're going to have a high bill for that property tax. Yeah. So here's an insider tip for y'all ticks. Yeah. When Wheeler asks you a question, they're about two to three minute long questions. That's when so you can that's, take a drink or that's when you eat take something. A drink. When I enough. ask you a question, you better sit fast because my questions are short. By I mean, the way, we have eaten this entire Texas heat pizza. You, you and I have eaten it. Scott's been talking Sorry, the whole Scott. time. Hey, listen, that, uh, that's, that's a good tip because I've been interviewed by Jason before and it's always very rapid fire. I have to be on my toes. You mean Whiteley, not Whiteley. Wheeler. Definitely Whiteley. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Jason's. Yeah. So Jason well, squared here. When Wheeler asks you a question, it's going to go he, on. He for goes a while. on for a little while. I can take a break. I let Thank you breathe. You. So, uh, you know, let's talk about something the governor did and this call for a second special session. At, at the, the very beginning, he said he wants to eliminate yeah. a property tax, something mm -hmm. called MO, maintenance and operation, which is uh, for school districts, yeah. which is a massive chunk Huge. of what we all pay. And I've, I've talked to Republican lawmakers, I've talked to Democratic lawmakers, I've talked to officials in the House, officials in the Senate. I yep. said, how, how does this happen? What's the plan? By the way, I finished a slice of pizza and had a drink while you've been, while you've been talking. Yeah, right. Wheeler's on a second beer, just guys. Saying. Okay, just for, for the <laughs> record. mead. Does second that count mead. as beer? Mead. Right. Yeah, okay. Call it a mead. Call it what it is. So, <laughs> so Abbott, <laughs> Abbott wants to eliminate a property tax, the yeah. biggest portion we all pay. Yeah. There's going to be no income tax in this state. That's right. Raising the sales taxes out of the question from everything I can find out in, 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 yep. uh, in Austin. 
What makes up that revenue for school districts? Uh, well, that that's why it's not going to happen. So the, what the uh, proposal, it's the, it's the right question. What the proclamation says is that he wants to see legislation that, quote, puts Texas on a path to eliminating the MNO. By 2035. Uh, right. Right. Um, that when he will, in all likelihood, obviously not be in office anymore. Uh, although some of these people just stay forever. Maybe. You know, the, yeah. it, you know um, when Abbott finishes this current term, just a side note, we will be coming up on nearly 30 years of just two governors, yep. Perry and Abbott. It'll be 26 years at the end of Abbott's term. Um, I've had a lot of Republican consultants say that if they if they get the chance to uh, be in charge of uh, a governor campaign next time around, uh, that whoever the candidate is needs to be in favor of term limits for for the governor and the lieutenant governor. These guys just stick around forever. They, um, <laughs> they need the work, man. That said, you get um, comfy. Th yeah, it, there's there's no accountability in that. Uh, and and look, th th there was a guy, as Lieutenant Governor Patrick said, and he said this at the Texas Public Policy Foundation at their tax-free building in downtown Austin where they don't pay property taxes yeah. because they're a nonprofit. Um, <laughs> That's great. Ironically, uh, the, the Texas Public Policy Foundation is in favor of what Abbott's talking about. Patrick is against Abbott and the TPPF plan. And Patrick said that that's a fantasy, that that is not going to happen, that, that, that there's no way to put us on a path to eliminating m and property taxes for school districts in Texas. And he pointed out there was one guy who ran on that platform uh, when he was running for governor against Abbott in the last GOP primary. His name is Don Huffines. Mm -hmm. And remember, uh, and Patrick said, by the way, he didn't win. Uh -huh. He said, I'm just gonna leave it at that. I'll go a step further with it. Um, Don Huffines, Alan West, who's a former Republican party chairman and entertainer, Chad Prather, I'm using entertainer right. loosely. Yeah. All three of those guys ran against Abbott and he still smoked them all with 66%. So the question has been asked, including by uh, Senator Nathan Johnson uh, from Dallas, a Democrat who beat Don Huffines in a general election for the seat that he holds. So why is Don Huffines still calling the shots around here? And it's because Abbott is afraid of his right flank. Uh, still, even after he, I'm sorry, he beat the piss out of them in that GOP primary. Uh, and he has no real reason to be uh, afraid of them. Uh, but he certainly is, and Patrick isn't. You know, Patrick, I think, is, uh, we've described him often at Quorum Report as sort of the spiritual leader of the Republican Party in Texas. Um, uh, you know, when I, when I talk to conservative Republicans around the state, they don't really know what property tax compression is. They haven't really heard this plan from the losing candidate for governor a year ago. Uh, they do know what a homestead exemption is. Yep, you can see that on. Do. You can see the difference on your bill, and that's why it's more of a populist sort of thing for Patrick to be making that argument. He's got the politics of it right. And look, there's nothing wrong with, and I think it's an acceptable policy to say we're going to put more money into the cost of public education because it is such a big cost. But to use one-time money for something that's an ongoing cost, almost any real conservative would tell you that's not a good idea. Right. So, the, so what's being talked about now, though, is... I know I can drink now. No. Yeah, so you, now you, look, can, you, you have time to go to the bar and order yeah, another one. Talking, I'll tell you what, so I'm, I'm going to be back. back. With you, can, you can have my second mead while I'm asking this. So, uh, you know, here's the thing. You know, now they're talking about coupling this with giving some extra money to teachers. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, which really makes you wonder... Are vouchers going to get done in a special session or education savings accounts, as the governor likes to call them now? Uh, are they going to be getting done in a special session? This is something he has spent a lot of political campaign or, or capital campaigning on, but it didn't happen in the regular. And now, it, you know, if, if teachers you know, get some money mm -hmm. out of this, it may not happen in a special session either. Republican leadership acknowledges, and this is uh, something that Governor Abbott knows, the lieutenant governor knows, the speaker knows, they all acknowledge that you cannot pass a school voucher plan. I'll, I'll give you another term for it. You can't pass a private school coupon plan. I describe Thank it as you. a coupon. Think about think, think about um, uh, if you have a, a private school tuition that is $14,000 or something like that, which is not uncommon, but you have an $8,000 voucher, your $8,000 coupon, and you could go work the math on that. Let, make it really easy. Say it was... Uh, $10,000 tuition and it's an $8,000 voucher. And I'm using 8,000 because that was one of the proposals. A family that can't afford month to month to pay their electricity bill on time does not have the 2,000 extra dollars. That their does kid, help people to understand it better, I think. Their kid is not going to a private school if that's what the proposal is. And that's one of the ones that the Senate pressed for this year. There have been multiple uh, attempts at this. Uh, and in Texas, it just doesn't work. And it, it doesn't work for a variety of reasons. Um, look, I think w it, I was asked the other day, uh, if I would go on the air with a conservative radio host and debate them about school choice. They said they wanted to have someone on the air that, that doesn't agree with school choice. I said, I don't disagree with school choice. 
what do you, they said, oh, we mean vouchers. I said, now we're talking. Now, it, I am against that. And the reason I'm against that is because it just doesn't work. In the Texas Constitution, this is the redneck version, it says that it doesn't matter who your daddy is, you're supposed to get the same level of education, whether you grow up in East El Paso County, mm -hmm. where parts of that area don't have running water, mm -hmm. or here in Highland Park in Dallas, they should get the same quality of public education wherever they are. It's not something that can actually be achieved, but it's something that we strive for. It's aspirational. And I've never heard any candidate for office in this state say that should come out of the Constitution. So what do they say? We, we want to help lift kids out of failing schools. All right. So what's the proposal for that? There was a proposal from the House to say, OK, if a kid is at a and you know we have this luxury in Texas, there is a system set up uh, to rate the campuses A through F. There was a proposal that said if a kid's going to an F-rated campus and or they are a special needs student, they could qualify for the voucher. That would be something like 750,000 to 800,000 kids in Texas would be eligible for that. The governor immediately said no, he would veto that. But what do the supporters of school choice always say? That they want to get kids out of failing schools. That was literally a proposal to do that, and the governor said no, right? So what are the other proposals? Uh, one that would include every school, school student in Texas. That's a no-go in the Texas House. You saw there were two decisive votes in the House against this. Right. And again, um, Republicans are the ones opposing it, especially in rural areas yep. and suburban. Well, yes, sir. Republicans and Democrats joining together for a near supermajority in the Texas House when in the uh, budget debate, there's sort of a traditional amendment that's offered to prohibit tax dollars from going to uh, school vouchers. And that passed with, all, you know, around 90 votes. Um, and so if you look at those votes and say, OK, are all those people anti-school voucher? Well, I think some people have different reasons for voting that way on that amendment. But this is even more key, I think. Later in the session, the chairman of the Public Education Committee, Brad Buckley, uh, from uh, the heart of Texas, Colleen, um, he said that he was gonna hold a meeting one evening to vote on a school voucher bill that had never been heard in the committee yet. And in the Texas House, it's very common for committees to meet and vote on legislation without having a full hearing. It's usually one of those things that just happens by unanimous consent. All the members don't care and they let the, you know, they let the committee go meet. There was a member from rural Texas uh, named Ernest Bales who got up on the back mic of the house and said, wait, 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 what is this bill that you're gonna vote on? The, the chairman was sketchy in even telling the members of the house what the bill was. Mm -hmm. And then the house voted against a majority of legislators, Republicans and Democrats, voting against even allowing the committee to meet right. to talk about a school voucher bill. The governor, as far as I can tell, the governor has not moved the needle at all. Let me give you one example. I was at an event in Corsicana. You saw he was doing a voucher vaudeville all <laughs> over the state. He was doing this traveling <laughs> road show. And he the was promoting it across the state. Yep. Yeah. And so I go to Corsicana for this event and they had uh, cookies from the Collins Street Bakery there as snacks. So good. good. I, I shouldn't have eaten the, the cherry <laughs> icebox cookie. That is, that is, the, it is the bomb. Uh, shouldn't Imagine have eaten that with a blackberry mead. Oh, wow. Yeah, Jeez. Um, that, that's just blackout. Uh, <laughs> sort of thing. What a sugar rush. Um, fortunately for y'all, I never lose my place. So the, so the governor is pitching his idea for vouchers to this rural crowd in Navarro County. Um, and the person who introduced him is the uh, state rep for the area, Cody Harris, who is from Palestine, Texas, out in East Texas. And uh, Harris, who's a conservative Republican, he introduces the governor uh, by saying that we need to fight the woke liberal agenda in schools. And he's got the crowd going along with that. And, you know, he says the governor's been a great partner in keeping this state an economic powerhouse and all of that. He's got the crowd cheering, but he never says anything about school vouchers. He sits down. Then the governor goes <laughs> to the microphone and he's given his rap about school vouchers. And uh, Abbott, uh, at one point, says to the crowd, if you support my plan for school choice, you need to call your state rep and tell him to support it as well. And I'm thinking he's, I'm thinking right he's sitting right here. This could not be more awkward. And then, and then after that is when you see the votes on the floor that are anti-school voucher. He had not moved the needle even a little. And, and I'll give you uh, the, I, the best comparison I can come up with. Do you remember in 2004 when George W. Bush was reelected, the campaign promises were that our, we would all be kept safe from terrorism and that gay marriage was going to be outlawed nationally through a constitutional amendment. Y'all remember that? Mm -hmm. When he was sworn in, what did former Governor Bush do in, in the first six months of his uh, second term in office? He traveled the country to talk about privatization of Social Security. And the more he talked about it, the more people didn't like it. Hmm. Uh, you could see that in the polling. Think about what's happening now. Abbott campaigned on property tax cuts, which he isn't getting done. And the first six months of this term, he has spent doing what? Trying to privatize public education. 
And the more he talks about it, the more the House members don't like it. It went from, it sort of went from a position of we don't like this and we're against it to maybe sort of a more of a middle finger at you because you're pressing us so hard about something that we don't agree with that's not good for our communities. Uh, you had one state senator, Robert Nichols from East Texas, who's a Republican, one Republican who voted against vouchers in the Senate after he spent time traveling his large district in, in, in deep East Texas, talking to every superintendent, talking to the public education community and to parents and to you know voters and to everybody and say, hey, look, he, he says, hit me with the hard questions about yeah. what you what you want to know about this proposal. And when the meetings were held in Austin, those questions that they had asked him or the questions he asked the people who were proposing mm. this stuff and the answers were not sufficient. So he voted no. Mm. So what happens with school vouchers? Obviously, the governor's been touting this all across the state, yeah. but it doesn't I haven't heard of a single vote that is that has changed on this. And, and what lawmakers, especially Republicans, are telling me is that, have you noticed something widely? The governor is never on the floor of the House. He's never over there talking to people. He's not negotiating right. things. He's, he's not in the, in the center of it like Rick Perry, like George mm -hmm. W. Bush yep. uh, when they were in there. Is, is this simply Abbott needing to, to, to get out and press the flesh and, 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 and talk to people and, and have them over for breakfast at the governor's mansion to, to get his things passed? And we look at property taxes as well. He said, you know what? If you I guys, can have a drink during this one. Yeah, you See, can. Don't it, drink a lot because I'm about to ask It's questions. happened with every question <laughs> since he said something, hasn't it? <laughs> That'll teach you to give Wheeler yeah. a hard time. I, oh, no, there, nothing <laughs> right. will teach me to give Wheeler a hard uh, okay. time. But, uh, you, you know, the call for the second special session yeah. from, from Abbott was, mm -hmm. this is what I want, but if you can't come to an agreement on what I want, come up with your own stuff, pass it to me, I'll sign it into mm -hmm. law. Why isn't he in the middle of this negotiating this? It's a win-win-win for everybody. Two things. One, this governor has never done what you're talking about as far as talking to the members in person, uh, really negotiating with them. His office does a window dressing version of this. You'll see on social media, the governor's office will release photos of him talking to legislators in the office. It's usually that they bring them in, one, my understanding is, they bring them in sort of one at a time on one afternoon, and then during the week, they'll put the pictures out. So, Funny that you know the governor has the, the same shirt. Period. Well, the governor has the same shirt every time. Same tie. Or, yeah. or is, maybe is he that not meeting, comfortable doing this, Scott? Or, he, or, he's or, not. What do you think it is? Because he's different from Rick Perry. He is. So Governor Perry was a legislator. He had been uh, a Democratic st uh, state representative uh, from West Texas. So when he first entered the political process, as a House member, and then as the Lieutenant Governor briefly. Uh, which nobody even remembers that because right. it's so quick. Uh, but he understands the legislative process and he understood that to get the things done that he wanted to get done, he had to have those hard conversations, especially if he knew that they didn't agree at the outset. And he knew that, you know, in a negotiation, and maybe um, Governor Abbott could read The Art of the Deal uh, from Trump, um, that you're not going to get everything that you want and you need to listen to what the other person wants so you can figure out what, what you can craft together that you can both be okay with. Um, you know, when, when Governor Perry was first uh, in, in the governor's office, his first session, he vetoed uh, the most bills that a governor has ever vetoed in Texas mm. with no warning to the members. 83 of them. Yes. And at Quorum Report at the time, we called those the, um, the drive-by vetoes because <laughs> there was no warning of them. And, 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 and did you know this? That at the time, now when you see a veto, there's a veto message. Uh, that says why the governor didn't like this sure. bill, and this governor, uh, Governor Abbott, has added a, another layer to that. At the time, when Governor Perry did that, the veto messages didn't even match the bills. It, he didn't care about the bills. He, w he was making a larger point, which and because there were a lot of uh, folks uh, in Texas who, and a lot of legislators, who didn't see him as legitimate because he hadn't been elected governor. He was elevated from lieutenant governor to governor when George Bush went to the White House. So basically he was saying, I am the governor, and there's a new sheriff in town, and y'all need to come talk to me. And he was doing it to establish relationships. Abbott is driving people away with the way that he did his vetoes uh, and the way he's carried out his job uh, throughout the time he's been in office. Um, Governor Abbott, um, he still views his job the way that he viewed it when he was on the Texas Supreme Court. And he said this in an interview, I think it was in uh, 2015 or 2017, uh, during the first term of his, uh, of his governorship. He had said, you know, it's not that different from the way it was when I was a judge, um, you know, that these wow. folks all make their arguments and and I make my rulings. I either sign the law or I veto it. And I was talking with someone who used to work in the governor's office, a former top staffer uh, who said that, you know, the formal term we use is the veto period. The, the governor has so many days to either sign or veto bills or just let them go into law without his signature in the office. They call it the ruling period. 
because the governor's making his rulings on these bills. Does he like them? Does he like them or not? Now, I can tell you uh, the way he was doing his vetoes. I asked uh, some folks who have been in the legislative process for 35 or 40 years. Uh, I said, have you ever seen that where the governor says, hey, this bill might, might not be too bad. We can come back and look at that bill again in a future special session when we pass something else. And in some cases he was trying to pass, he wants to pass property tax relief. In other cases, he wants to pass the school vouchers. And those legislative veterans said, no, they have never seen a governor do that that way. Mm. So whether that will work, I don't think so. I heard from very conservative Republicans who saw their legislation vetoed, who said that they felt angry and frustrated and a sense of betrayal through what he was doing. And he hadn't warned them at all. He hadn't talked to them at all about their legislation. Uh, when he would say at a certain, through his veto proclamation, would say, I want you to pass this other bill. This uh, w one Republican said to me, why don't you just pick up the phone and let's have a conversation? Now, that, that's one problem. The other problem is this. He has not done the work to pass a complete remake of public education in Texas. When, when school vouchers were passed in Iowa, the governor there, um, uh, um, her name's escaping me, Kim Reynolds. When Kim, Re it's all in here, it's an encyc encyclopedia. <laughs> when Kim Reynolds passed the bill there, it's because she spent multiple campaign cycles working against people in her own party to install lawmakers who would vote her way. I was talking to a former state rep from Iowa who said that he was a former state rep because the governor had decapitated him in his primary because he was not sufficiently supportive. Uh, he, he, did, he wasn't even against it. He just wasn't for it enough uh, for her, uh, uh, her voucher proposal. And they had a similar challenge in passing the bill there because they had opposition from rural Republicans who didn't see any benefit to their communities. Uh, and I think in Texas, because of the school finance situation here, it's not just that there's no benefit for them, it would hurt their communities. I grew up in Wharton County, Texas. I went to the Louise ISD when I was a kid. And I'm here to tell you, if we didn't have the, that, that system I talked about, where everybody gets a fair shot, we would have been in 1985, 1986, we would have probably still been in a one room schoolhouse Every kid K through 12 learning from a lady teaching on a dirt floor because all the money would be in the big cities. It wouldn't be evenly distributed around the state. If you throw school vouchers into the mix, you screw up all of that. And you're starting to see that happen in Arizona where they have a different school finance system. But you've seen some of the reporting there. With all the school choice people were you know, talking about how great this is that Arizona passed this. And now Republicans in Arizona are coming to grips with the fact that it's breaking their budget um, to, to do this school voucher deal. So I don't know that they can get it done. Um, I think the governor would be wise to give uh, give the lawmakers at least some time to breathe. Uh, we have reported a quorum report that the school voucher special session may happen in September for two reasons. One, that he would have more time to try to have those conversations that you're talking about. And then the other reason would be that teachers will be going back to work at school and they won't be down at the Capitol to rally against vouchers every day. Uh, so uh, let's close with the, the impeachment of Ken Paxton in the trial. Let's do it. Uh, so you just talked about, you know, uh, another case where Republicans were decapitated in primaries. <laughs> no matter how this goes, are we going to see a lot of that come next year? Because the Republican Party of Texas has already come out really fiercely against those who pushed through this impeachment in the first place. Yeah. How much fighting are we going to see after the dust settles in the, in the Senate chambers uh, with this trial in September? I think it's one of those things that won't necessarily, as an issue, it won't get uh, members of the legislature beat in their primaries, but it will be an indicator of where money is going to flow against them. So there are these third party groups, so which I consider at this point the Republican Party of Texas to be one of the right wing enforcement groups in the state. Put it right there with Texas Right to Life or groups that, a group that used to be there called Empower Texans, Texas Scorecard. Defend Texas Liberty based here in North Texas. Uh, all of this funded by a handful of billionaires from West Texas uh, who have sort of a, a Christian nationalist way of thinking and they want state government to reflect that. And they have, for them to spend millions of dollars, uh, I'm sorry guys, but it, for them, it's like if you and I found some change in our couch. So they, they, they've got the money, it, as I say, it, it comes out of the ground in West Texas. Uh, and so, and so the, the, the fact is that um, there's going to be well-funded primaries and the way that uh, state legislators in the House voted on the impeachment. That's going to tell you, I mean, you, all of them who are Republicans probably have a target on their back for their primaries. We'll see how well funded it is and, and who has, you know, who has the best case they can make for their reelections. But I don't think it's going to be the thing that's going to get them beat. Instead, what you'll see in their districts are mail pieces and maybe radio and TV ads that say that they're weak on pro-life issues. They're not pro-Second Amendment enough and, th and they're not tough enough on the border and things like that. Those are the kind of things that actually get them beat. Um, but as far as how this is going to play out, I, I, I've been trying to game it out. Jason, you and I talked, Jason Whiteley, you and I talked about this previously. That's a hard thing to do it on this is, show. I know. 
and, Jason, and Jason, have a drink, drink on top of it. <laughs> yeah, and he said he says. He tells me, come in here and drink, and then try to talk to two guys named Jason. So, uh, <laughs> so that was a stiff drink to begin with. Yeah, straight vodka. <laughs> and Well, at least it, it's starting to dilute. The ice is melting. Um, Mr. Whiteley, you and I talked about this previously. Right. We talked about it previously, um, you know, how this might go. I think you're right to be skeptical that the Senate would convict and remove Ken Paxton. I'm skeptical as well. But I don't rule it out. Yeah. And I, I think You that, don't rule it out? I don't. I think, I think that... Um, the way that the lieutenant governor has talked about this on, in different occasions gives me mixed signals. You know, he told you uh, on WFAA that, uh, that hey, we're going to take it seriously. You know, the, the senators are, are the jurors and they have to, you know, do their duty. It's a solemn duty. He's right about that. Um, on the Mark Davis show the other day, he was a little less serious about it. He, he sort of, I think he was not saying that the Senate wouldn't take their job seriously, but he was almost blaming the Speaker of the House, Dade Phelan, for, for having given the, the Senate this job to do. Um, and it, I, I think that it, there's an urgency to this among some Republicans. How many times have you heard people say, well, look, since he was impeached, a lot of, especially Democrats, would say, well, Republicans never cared about all that stuff that uh, Ken Paxson was accused of before. But that's not true. There was a well-funded primary against him. Three people ran against him. Liberals like Louis Gummert. <laughs> the former say, congressman. Say that again. <laughs> yeah, Louis Gohmert, who is not a liberal, one of the most conservative, now former members of Congress, uh, he was campaigning against Ken Paxton only on the allegations against yep, him. Right? He didn't he, pull any punches. Yeah, but he had no problem with his policies. He had no problem with the kind of lawsuits he files against the federal government, fighting right. the Biden administration, all, sort of, all that sort of stuff. Um, I think there's an urgency among Republicans um, in sort of the upper echelon of the party. I don't mean the... the the official apparatus, the, the Texas GOP, the Republican Party of Texas, but among Republican office holders, and I would say among more responsible Republicans, the urgency is this, that, and this is as high stakes as it could be. He's either going to be, there's no slap on the wrist here. He's either removed from office. Uh, he, he, right now his, his swipe card, it doesn't work and his parking space has been taken away mm -hmm. at the office. He wants to get that back. Um, he's either going to be removed permanently or he'll be put back in office. And if he's put back in office, He's in line to be governor of Texas. That's that's the last office that Abbott had. Um, it's it's natural line of succession sort of stuff. Um, and I think that you had to, to a question you asked earlier, Mr. Wheeler. You do not have a Democratic Party that's anywhere close to getting their act together. That might change. There's always you know hope springs eternal. Um, but in the meantime, I don't think Republicans want to go into the next gubernatorial election cycle after that next presidential cycle. They don't want to go into that cycle with Ken Paxson at the top of the ticket. So they're trying to deal with this now. Mm -hmm. So now you probably know why we've been waiting for Braddock for so long Yeah. with this kind of insight. It's just great. It's yeah. like we could just let you go on and on. Please don't do that. We'll buy, we'll buy another <laughs> bottle of vodka. Here. We'll get table service over here. How about that? Okay, bottle service? <laughs> <laughs> bottle service. So you know what it's called. Evidently, I didn't get it right here. Jason doesn't go out much. Yeah. Whiteley yeah. doesn't go out Sorry. much. Sorry. Clearly I've never, not. I've never been to a place of bottle service. Sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry about that reference. Yes. Sure you have. Sure you have. <laughs> Scott Braddock is the editor of the Quorum Report, a longtime friend of ours, and uh, one of the most source reporters, if not the most source reporter at the state capitol of Texas. Always glad to have you, man. Gentlemen, you do a great show. I listen every week. I appreciate what y'all do. Y'all are bringing so many different perspectives in that you know, and and we you know we steal from y'all all the time on our show. You know, it's funny, a, we do the same you, thing you, with you. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I'm like, oh wow, they talked to that person. That, that's amazing. They talked to Glenn Whitley. They talked to you know uh, Colin Allred. They talked to whoever. Right. Oh, to you had the you had you had the legends. Dick oh, DeGaren, Dick DeGaren and, uh, and, uh, Rusty. and Rusty Harden. Rusty, yeah. That was an amazing edition of the show. Oh, but no, I really appreciate what y'all do, and thanks for having me. Thank, Thank you. you.